Amen. So turn to Genesis 27. As we come into this chapter, we find ourselves caught up in the middle of one of the greatest soap operas of all time. For this is a chapter of deceit and lying and conniving and scheming and bitterness. And it all takes place with one family, Isaac, his wife, Rebecca, and their twin sons, Esau and Jacob. It was back in chapter 25 where we saw that after 20 years of marriage, Isaac and Rebecca finally were able to get pregnant. He was 60 years old when the boys were born. We're not sure how old Rebecca was. She may have been around 40-ish or so. We don't know. But it was during her pregnancy that these twins within her were really battling it out. And, you know, it was like, you know, World Wrestling Federation going on inside of her. And she's starting to get a little worried. And so she cries out to the Lord and says, if all is well, why am I like this? And then the Lord spoke to her and told her this amazing prophecy. God said, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. And so through this proper, uh, prophecy, God made it very clear to Rebekah that the firstborn Esau would not receive the birthright nor the primary inheritance from Isaac, but God chose Jacob. He's the second born. And it was very unusual in that culture to do that to the second born, but God wanted Jacob to receive the inheritance and the blessing. God chose Jacob. Now, as we've also seen, Esau was a very worldly person. He could care less about the things of God. We saw that he sold his birthright years earlier to his twin brother Jacob for a bowl of stew. So he had no intentions of doing things God's way. He just wanted to satisfy his flesh. So everything is on track for Jacob to receive the family blessing from his father. But there's one small problem. As we saw at the end of chapter 25, we're told that Isaac loved Esau because Esau would capture game and prepare him a wonderful feast. And it would, he'd bring it to his dad and uh, Esau was loved by his father because he did that. But with Rebecca, we saw, it simply says, Rebecca loved Jacob. No strings attached. So they both had their favorites, but Isaac loved Esau because of what Esau could do for him. So it was conditional love. Rebecca loved Jacob, period. Now, maybe that was because of God's prophecy to her concerning the twins. And we've already seen how Esau grieved his parents because he ran off and he married two pagan women, disobeying the Lord, disobeying his parents. And at the end of chapter 26, it says, of these two women that Esau married, they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. So now as we come to chapter 27, we'll see that the twins, don't think of them as little boys, they're 77 years old. Isaac, as you go through all these things, you realize he's 137 years old at this point. And Rebecca has been holding on to this prophecy for about 77 years. She knows that Jacob is supposed to receive the family blessing. But in this chapter, it looks like Isaac is going to give it to Esau. So what we'll see her do is something that many of us have done. In other words, she has God's word, just like we have God's word. She has God's promises, just like we have so many promises of God from his word. But here's the problem that Rebecca had that we can also face. Instead of waiting on the Lord, instead of stepping out in faith when he calls us to, like Rebecca, we can start scheming and conniving and plotting to try to help God out to fulfill God's plans, that's never a good thing to do. We've all done it, but when we do, we often make things worse for ourselves and for those around us. But never forget this simple little phrase, the Holy Spirit makes a better Holy Spirit than you do. The Holy Spirit makes a better, infinitely better Holy Spirit than we do. So let's pick up in chapter 27. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am. 
Then he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. And unless you are on death row and you know you're going to be executed tomorrow, none of us know the day of our death. Uh, you know, our time is in God's hands. Our days are numbered. But again, Isaac, notice he's gone blind here. Uh, he seems to be pretty much bedridden. His half-brother, Ishmael, died about 14 years earlier when he was 137 years old because he was 14 years older, the son of Abraham and Hagar. So when he dies at 137, Ishmael or Isaac is now 137 and he's blind thinking, I'll probably die just like my half-brother Ishmael. And so he thinks the end is near. The amazing thing is, how old does Isaac live to be? 180. So he's got 43 more years to hang in there, to live. Now, we know that God had done many wonderful things through Isaac and for Isaac over the years. God had blessed him tremendously. But for some reason, he goes against God's plans for these twins. He favors Esau over Jacob. And so he's going to try to reverse God's plans. Unfortunately, this is a case of how bad leadership in a home can cause a chain reaction to the rest of the family that leads to lies, deception, pain, and all kinds of things, bitterness and anger and so forth. And it's all because God's word was not believed, nor was it heeded. Now, even though Isaac did not finish the race well, he would eventually stumble over the finish line. We know Isaac's in heaven because the Bible is very clear. God says he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Jesus uses that to prove the resurrection, that God is the God of the living and not the dead. When he says, yes, haven't you heard? God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we know Isaac is, you know, he's saved, he's in heaven. But at the same time, we should all want to finish the race well, the race of life, you know, with Isaac, he didn't finish all that well. But I love the Apostle Paul for that fact that he was sold out to Jesus. He never gave in. He didn't trust his own flesh. He trusted the Lord. He believed God. He walked with the Lord. And he knew um, that he was going to be put to death for his faith. He had been rearrested by the Roman Empire. He's in Rome. Uh, they're going to execute him. And about three months before he is put to death, Paul writes his final letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So he finished well. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. But the very next thing we read is Paul urging Timothy to come quickly. And then he says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And then he goes on to say, Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Now, why do I bring up Demas and Mark in context with Isaac not finishing well? Well, at this moment in Paul's life, Demas and Mark were on two very different trajectories. Demas, he's going down. We have three times Demas mentioned in the Scriptures. Chronologically, he's mentioned in Philemon, and Paul says of Demas, he is a co-laborer with me in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second time, chronologically, in uh, Colossians 4, he simply says, Demas says hi. And then here, the third time Demas is mentioned at the end of Paul's life, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I mean, he's spinning downward. He is out of control. On the other side of the coin is Mark. Mark was on a different trajectory. Mark, if you remember was the young cousin of Barnabas. And when Paul and Barnabas go on their first missionary journey, they take Mark with them. Halfway through, Mark bails out. Mark's afraid. He basically wimped out, and so he goes back to Jerusalem. After Paul and Barnabas finish up their first missionary journey, they get back, and, and they're giving their report to everybody, and, and then Barnabas says, hey, let's go again. 
And Paul's like, yeah, that'll be great. And then Barnabas says, let's take Mark with us. And Paul says, not so great. And they get in an argument. And you can read about this in um, Acts chapter 15, verse 36. It says, they became so heated in their argument, they went different directions. So Paul says, I don't want anything to do with Mark. He wimped out on us. Well, then we read about Mark later on in Philemon, and it says that he's now a co-laborer with you know, Erastus and um, Luke in Philemon. But then here at the end of Paul's life, he says, bring Mark with you. He is useful to me in ministry. His trajectory is going up. I bring all that up for the simple reason that no matter where your trajectory is in this life at this moment, if you're heading downward like Demas, call out to Jesus. If you're spiraling down, turn to the Lord. Humble yourself before God, repent of your sin, and He will bring you back. You don't need to be stuck in the muck and the mire of this sinful world. Just like the prodigal son, he left, he blew it everything, you know, all his riches, he blew on wine, women, and song, he's in a mud hole. And then it says he came to his senses, he humbled himself, and he came back to his father. And his father rejoiced that he came back. And the sooner we realize that God's word and his will and his ways are always best for us, that God does not want to mess us up, He doesn't want to mess us over, the sooner we'll come to know that God has always loved us and He will always love us. And then verses like Jeremiah 29, 11 make a lot more sense. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's how God thinks of you today. He's not trying to mess you up. He's trying to bring you closer to Him. And He always loves you. He always will love you. He's not against you. He's for you. And the sooner we realize when we humble ourselves and obey the Lord and stop listening to the world, we will be set free. Well, look at verse 3 here in 27. It says, Now therefore, this is Isaac talking to Esau, his son. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Again, this is so sad because the main reason he loved Esau was because of the savory, tasty food that Esau killed and cooked up for him. The biggest problem we see here is how stubborn Isaac is concerning the blessing he's supposed to give to Jacob. I mean, he's being stubborn. I'm going to give this to my firstborn. It's almost like Isaac is saying to God, come on, Lord, you got to taste some of this food of Esau's, then you'll know what I'm talking about. But God's like, no, the blessing is for Jacob, not for Esau. Again, it's never a good idea to go against the clear word of God. This is why verses like James 4, verse 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know, it's amazing how many clear verses tell us, this is the will of God, this is what I have for you. And so many Christians will still try and justify why they feel it's okay to do the opposite of what God says. Well, it's okay, Lord, because I'm really trying to be whatever to this person, and they compromise, and they get into sin, and it's not going to work out. This is why Paul warns us in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. So you sow to the flesh, to the world. You do things your way and not God's way, and you're going to reap corruption. You're going to reap destruction. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You know, it's true. We reap what we sow. Whatever you plant, that's what grows. You plant the seeds of your life into the things of this world, you're going to produce worldly stuff. You plant the things of the Lord around you, and God will bless that and bring an increase. Look at verse 5. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it 
So Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me there, from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it, and that he may bless you before his death. And so here we see Rebecca's scheming spring into action here. She just so happens to be eavesdropping, and when she sees Isaac summoning Esau to his tent, she follows. She's just outside the tent, probably listening to everything that's being said. So she goes into what we can call today Operation Warp Speed. <laughs> in a bad way. I mean, she goes into Operation Warp Speed mode. In her mind, there's no way Esau can receive the blessing from Isaac. She knows God's word. God told her, told her specifically it's going to be the younger one that receives the blessing. That's Jacob. And she knows God's will. Esau is a fleshly man. He has no concern for the things of God. But this is where her scheming comes in, because just as important as knowing God's word and knowing God's will is to do things God's way. Too many people, they try to justify their sinful behavior by saying, I know what God's word says, I know what his will is, and I'm going to make it happen no matter what. And we see so many churches going off base because they're not doing things God's way. They're trying to bring the world in. Instead of doing things according to the will of God and the word of God, we got to do it his way. That's what Rebecca does not do here. She, notice, she says to her son Jacob, Obey my voice according to what I command you. That's not what her 77-year-old son needed to hear. You know, it's so sad. They should have stopped planning, and they should have started praying. And they, I'm sure if they stopped planning and scheming, God could have showed them, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I want you to go to Isaac. We don't know the side of heaven, how it would have turned out if they would have started praying instead of scheming. But God could have said, you know what? I'm going to send Esau away. And he's not going to find any game. He could be gone for a week or two. And why don't you guys pray and then go talk to Isaac and remind him of the prophecy I gave Rebecca and Isaac, and maybe the light bulb will come on. I mean, one of those type of things. But they didn't. Instead of listening to the Lord, she tries to scheme it all out. But lying, deceiving, conniving is not God's way of doing things that's the enemy's way. But as we'll see, when all is said and done, God's word, God's will, will be accomplished one way or the other. With our help or without our help, God will do what he's going to do. I think the best commentary on this whole situation with Re uh, Rebecca and with Jacob and all that they're scheming and doing, the opposite is found in James chapter 3, Verses 13 to 15, as we read these, notice how opposite this is of Rebekah and Jacob. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. And so Rebecca and Jacob, may, they, they chose foolishly. They did not choose wisely. They did not do it God's way. But they use worldly wisdom and they make things worse. I don't know about you, but I've certainly known what God's word says about something. It's clear in my mind this is God's will about something. 
But for whatever stupid reason, I'll resort to doing it my way and not God's way. And even if it works out in the end, I could have saved myself a lot of heartache, a lot of sleepless nights if I would have just said, you know what, I got to do this God's way. I got to follow through on what he wants me to do instead of trying to scheme and figure something out on my own. Spurgeon once said, it's always best to leave the Lord's decrees in the Lord's hands. That's so true. God's ways are so much higher than our ways. His ways are so much better than our ways. They're so much infinitely wiser than we can ever scheme up. The awesome thing is when you know it's God's word and you know it's God's will and you do it His way and it's accomplished for His glory, then guess what? You don't get the accolades. God does. You don't get the pat on the back and the attaboys. God does. You give all the glory to Him instead of taking it for yourself. The Bible warns us, do not touch the glory of God because it belongs only to the Lord. So Rebecca, you know, she's plotting, she's scheming here. And one of the sad things that comes out of this whole situation, she's going to hear after this is all said and done, Esau wants to kill Jacob. And so she helps Jacob escape and get out of Dodge. That'll be the last time she'll ever see her beloved son. She'll never see him again because she did it her way and not God's way. Verse 11, And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Notice how he says, If I do this, I'll seem to be a deceiver. No, if you do this, you are a deceiver. In other words, I see, I'll seem to be a deceiver, meaning, you know, he's more worried about his reputation than he is about doing things God's way. He's more concerned about his outward appearance than the inward character. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that to do this same thing today, we're more concerned about what others think about us instead of being concerned about what God thinks about us. We're more concerned about our outward appearance around others instead of the inward character. Somebody once described character as what you do and how you live when you think nobody is watching you. That's important. God's always watching us. And when you have that consciousness of the Lord that He's with us always, He lives inside of us. You can't get away with anything, so why even try? But we still do. It's amazing. Again, when we do things God's way and not our way, God will take care of the blessing He has for us. So this deception grows bigger. Look at verse 13. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. So Rebecca's all in. Jacob's worried about receiving a curse rather than a blessing from his dad. But mom says, let the curse be on me. In other words, Rebecca's doing everything she can think of to help God bring his word and his will to pass. But again, her ways are not right. She snaps at Jacob. Obey my voice. Go get these things for me. So Jacob obeys his mom rather than God. But the amazing thing is God never gives up on Jacob. Jacob is a conniver. That's what his name means. He's a schemer, heel catcher. That's what Jacob means. God's going to have to work very diligently on him for many, many years before Jacob's finally broken, before Jacob finally submits and, and you know, submits his heart, his life fully to the Lord. But he could have avoided so much pain and suffering if he would have just humbled himself and done it God's way. The same is true for us. We can avoid so much pain, so much heartache, so much fr frustration if we would learn to yield ourselves to the Lord today instead of saying, I'll do it tomorrow, God. No, do it today. Look at verse 14. So Jacob and he went and got them, the two little goats, and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. 
And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So Rebecca must have known Esau's secret recipe for wild game feast. And so she makes this you know, taste just like Esau. Remember, Isaac is blind. And so she has to figure out how she can fool him and his other senses. And so the food has to be just right. He has to taste it and know this is Esau's. He has to smell just right. So he gets some of Esau's old dirty clothes, puts it on Jacob. You know, he, he has to um, feel just right. And so Jacob's worried, you know, my skin's smooth and Esau's hairy. And so what does she do? She puts goat skins, all the hair and fur on it, on his hands, back of his neck. Makes you wonder how hairy was Esau. I mean, that's crazy because Esau means hairy. So this guy was like a gorilla or something. So anyway... Everything is ready to go. The plan is to deceive Isaac. It's in full gear. Now, as we watch this unfold before us, keep these scriptures in mind. John 8, verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. They're kind of walking in the shadows, if not in complete darkness. Then the Apostle John tells us, 1 John 1, 5, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. So there's no room for deception in the life of the believer. Jesus calls Satan a liar. He calls Satan a deceiver. We should have nothing to do with the ways of Satan, the unfruitful works of darkness. Paul exhorts us in uh, both Ephesians 4 and 5, Colossians chapter 3. He says we need to put off the deeds of the flesh, put off bitterness, envy, jealousy, wrath, anger. But then he says put on the things of the Lord, put on tender mercies, put on love, put on wisdom, meekness, humility, kindness. Watch how many lies Jacob now tells his father, starting in verse 18. This is that snowball effect. You tell one lie, you got to keep it up. So he went to his father and said, so he's you know, dressed up like his brother Esau, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Ugh, don't use God's name in vain. Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice. Take note of that. But the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. You know, just going through that, I, I find at least five lies that Jacob tells his father. But this is a great example of how one lie builds upon another. The end result usually doesn't work out so well. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He once said, a little lie is like pregnancy. You might not notice it at first, but as the months go on, it's apparent that there's a pregnancy. <laughs> and that's so true. You might cover it up for a while, but eventually you'll know. One of the fascinating things about this is how Isaac trusted in all of his senses, but in the one sense that I think is the most important, and that is hearing. He trusts in his touch. God created us with five senses, right? Touch, taste, smell, seeing, hearing. He can't see, but he's trusting in his touch. Oh, yeah, it feels like. 
He, he trusts in his smell. Yeah, it smells like Esau. But he's not trusting in hearing because he recognized that's the voice of Jacob. That's not Esau. I find something very interesting here. It's a great you know, spiritual application that we need to heed concerning our senses as well. The Lord has created us with those senses. But when it comes to faith, when it comes to trusting in the Lord, trusting in God, and growing in our relationship with the Lord, there's one sense that stands above the other five, and that is hearing. Romans 10, 17. Very important. Like our theme verse for Calvary Chapel Grand Junction. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, other senses are mentioned in our relationship with the Lord. Look at this verse, Psalm 34, verse 8. O oh, taste, there's taste, and see, there's your eyes, that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. In other words, it always comes back to learning and trusting and believing by hearing God's Word. That's the only way you're going to trust the Lord. You've got to know what God's Word says about the Lord. Jesus tells us to search the Scriptures, for they testify of me. That's why we've got to be in the Word of God. In John 5, 46, Jesus says, For if you believed Moses, you know, his writings, the Old Testament, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's the five books of Moses. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And then in John 10, 27, Jesus tells us, my sheep hear my voice. You, you got to hear the voice of the Lord that comes from the word of God. And I know them and they follow me. Again, the ability to hear Jesus's voice and discern that he is speaking to you comes as a result of spending time reading and studying the word of God. There's no shortcuts. There's no substitution. Spiritually speaking, people are most likely to be deceived and therefore make bad decisions when they rely on their senses of smell, sight, touch, those things, rather than what we hear and know from the Word of God. Pastor Chuck used to warn us, be careful of those, he would call them those who are the charismaniacs that come into the church. They want all the bells and whistles. They want all the you know, fog machines. And they want all this hoopla and stuff to get your senses and your emotions all worked up. But it always comes back to holding fast, believing the simple truth of God's Word. Be careful when people want to elevate emotional experiences over faith and trust in the Word of God. Because if we um, experience some new thing, some new teaching, and it doesn't line up with the Word of God. Oh, it sounds great. Oh, it looks good. Oh, people are saying, I'm a prophet, and they speak these things, but it's contrary to God's Word. Then it's just like Jacob pretending to be Esau. It's deception. Ephesians 5, verses 6 and 7, it gives us this warning. Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Again, we always have to go back to what God's Word says, not what other people say, but it's God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. That's His Word, period. You know, the Mormons have all these extra books that they've supposedly come up with, and God told us these things. No, they're lies from Satan because they contradict God's Word. The cult I grew up in, Mary Faker, Eddie, not Mary Baker, Mary Faker, Eddie, she had the keys of the scriptures. You know, the science and health is key to the scriptures by Mary Faker, Eddie. That's a lie. I grew up not knowing anything in the Bible. I knew these things in this, you know, her book that was an interpretation of what she got out of the Bible, but it was all nonsense. It was all this stuff that had nothing to do with God's Word. When you have the Holy Spirit living in you, the Word of God comes to life. He shines light on God's Word. That's the only way anybody can ever understand the Word of God is to be born again. That's why people around you, you talk to them about God. Jesus is coming back. The rapture could happen at any moment. And they look at you like you just fell off of Mars or something because they don't understand the things of the Spirit. 
They're spiritually discerned, Paul says to the Corinthians. They can't understand them because you can only understand these things when you're born again. Here's a great warning that Jeremiah gives us in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 30. And this is as the uh, Babylonians are destroying Judah, destroying Jerusalem, eventually destroying the temple in Jerusalem. Sobering words from this great prophet Jeremiah. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. So yeah, you believe in prophets? Not if they prophesy falsely. We're a non-profit organization. And the priests rule by their own power. But here, here's the sad part. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? In other words, the end result of lying, deceiving, is destruction, despair, eventually death. You know, Paul talks about that again in the last letter in 2 Timothy. You know, he says, you know, in these last days, there's going to be those who are just going to be wanting teachers that will tickle their ears. Just tell them whatever they want to hear. And they don't hold fast to the sound doctrine of God's Word. So be careful. Here we have Jacob in total co cooperation with his mother, Rebecca, lying, deceiving uh, to Isaac, his father. Are you really my son, Esau? Jacob said, I am. Now look at verse 25. He said, Isaac said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him. Totally deceived. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field They're rolling out there in the cow patties, which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Notice as he gives his blessing, he never mentions Esau's name. So this is going to be given to Jacob. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. Uh, again, this giving of the patriarchal blessing was and still is a very big deal in a Hebrew family. They took this very seriously. But as we've seen, God had already chosen, He'd already determined that Jacob, the younger son, would be given the status as the firstborn. He would receive the inheritance, which is, again, a very big deal. Now, don't forget, Esau, he despised his birthright. He sold it to Jacob for a bowl of stew many years earlier. He could care less about honoring his parents or trusting God's word as he went off and married pagan women. And as we'll see, the only reason Esau would get mad and upset about losing this inheritance is because he thinks it's all about gaining an earthly fortune. He could care less about any spiritual significance with being the firstborn. All he wanted was the loot. In fact, he'll be so upset with Jacob that he gets swindled, he'll want to kill Jacob. But at the same time, you know when he cools off and he becomes fine with Jacob? When Esau becomes wealthy. That's all he cared about. He didn't care about the things of God. He just wanted the money. Sadly, that's his whole life. He wanted money. He wanted power, thinking that those things would bring him peace and happiness and fulfillment. And if any of you have been on that roller coaster ride, you know those things will not fulfill. They cannot give you peace or happiness. Only Jesus can. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, verse 26, this is a perfect example of Esau. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So here Isaac blesses Jacob with a blessing that promises him not only personal wealth and provisions, but it also looks forward to the Jewish people down the road being blessed by, you know, through Jacob. Because Jacob, as you know, becomes 
the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that will start to fulfill all those promises God gave to Abraham. Remember back in chapter 12, verse 3, God gave him the Abrahamic covenant. And here Isaac even quotes part of that Abrahamic covenant that God would curse all those who curse you, Jacob, and your descendants. And God will bless all those who bless you. That's part of that Abrahamic covenant. We'll wrap it up here, just a few more verses. We'll save the rest of this for next time. Now it happened, verse 30. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. He also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Notice, then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. Again, once his blessing was given, it was irrevocable. It goes to Jacob. But do you know why Isaac trembled exceedingly? It's at this very moment that he realized that God was overturning his decision. And he's just you know, freaking out because he knows at this very moment God overruled him. He, he was trying to thwart God's plan, but God would not allow him to do it. God overruled his own selfish plan to bless Esau instead of Jacob. He's known this truth for 77 years, but Isaac still thought he could do it. He could thwart God's plan. But make no mistake about it, in the end, God's word, his will, and his ways will always prevail. The amazing thing, we'll look at more in more detail next time about this scene where he trembles exceedingly. This is the very moment when Isaac got saved. It tells us in the book of Hebrews that he blessed Jacob by faith. Wait a minute, you read, by faith, he was deceived. It was at that very moment that his faith kicked in because now he knows God overruled me. This is where he humbles himself. This is where he's broken before God. This is where Isaac's whole life is going to take a different direction because now he knows God's on the throne. God's in control. I can't do this. God's will must be done. You know, it's always to our benefit. It will always lead to God's blessing when we stop trying to manipulate, make things happen in our own power, and we simply humble ourselves before the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and bring us to the Word of God because the Word of God comes alive within us. And then we know what God has for us. Let me close with this. Um, you're familiar with this amazing proverb, Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones.